in Indiana and beyond. Hi, and welcome to this episode of VITA, Latino Life in Indiana and Beyond. I'm Dr. Christine Nemchik, and I am an assistant professor of history and world languages at IU East. Today, I'm going to be talking about the first episode in the PBS documentary series, which is Latino Americans, 500 Years of History. The first episode is called Foreigners in Their Own Land, and it deals with the period from 1565 to 1880. Uh, when we think of Latino Americans, we don't typically think of this time period. Um, it's not a time period of immigration. It's not a time period of the United States. Um, but it is a time period that starts the history of Latino Americans. And as the documentary tells us, this history, the history of Latino Americans, is our history. The history of Latino Americans that's told through these documentaries starts the story of the United States. Latino Americans, just like Americans, as we call ourselves, are offspring of people from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, from the indigenous peoples of this hemisphere. So they make up the same type of population as we have in our country. So there are generations of Latinos who have been living in this land that we call the United States for centuries before it was the United States. They were living here long before there were Americans, long before the British arrived in this land. So it is our history. When we think of this history, we think of Cristobal Colon, although we don't call him that. Cristobal Colon is his name in Spanish. We call him Christopher Columbus, and we embrace him as a part of our history. Everyone knows it. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? With his ships, the Niña, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. We have forgotten, though, or we don't think about, or maybe we never even knew about the others that came here and settled a large part of what is now the United States long before we ever moved west, long before we were ever here. If you look at a map of the Americas in the height of the Spanish Empire in the 1800s, you will see that they not only occupied almost all of South America, with the exception of Portuguese Brazil, but it also occupied, of course, Central America, Mexico, and a very large portion of what is present-day United States. A part or all of 17 of our current states were a part of the Spanish Empire. That's 34% of our nation's states were once a part of a Latino empire. This is significant. The oldest continuously occupied city in the United States is St. Augustine, Florida, which was established in 1565. This was when the Spanish um, soldier, Pedro Menendez Daviles, pushed the French Protestants from the region, established a fort there, and kept it as a Spanish-speaking city until 1821. In the late 20th and through the early part of the 21st century, there have been numerous debates about whether Florida should be bilingual or whether we should have it be an English-only state, which is interesting. When you think about the fact that it was a Spanish place and Spanish was spoken there for much longer than English has been a language there. We don't think about these things. So this is the story of episode one. Episode one tells of the story of these Latino Americans who were here and helped to establish what would later become the United States. The main part of the story is of those Latino Americans who were out west, not the ones in Florida, 
but the ones who came up over the Rio Grande and worked to establish the northern part of New Spain for the Spanish Empire. They pushed up into areas in Texas, in New Mexico, in Arizona, in California. When we think about the moving west in this land, we think about those brave cowboys and the westward push and taming the grand frontier. We think about the westward movement for gold in California, the thing that enthralled people to move to the other side of the country. We think about the Transcontinental Railroad that made these movements easier. And with that, the immigrants we think about are Asian immigrants, not Latinos. We don't think about those who came before them. We don't think about Juan de Oñate, who in 1595 was sent by King Philip II of Spain in order to pacify and settle the northern reaches of the Spanish Empire. And it's interesting because Oñate was a Spaniard, a Spaniard by heritage, but he was not a Spaniard by birth. He was already what we could say was a Latino American. He was born in Zacatecas in the Spanish Empire and he rose up to be significant within the church and he was sent on a mission in order to bring Roman Catholicism to the indigenous people in the northern parts of the empire. So that was the initial goal, bring Catholicism and establish missions. But they had to do this amongst indigenous people who were hostile many times to these ideas. And they did not always face indigenous people who were willing to accept this. And when the Acoma Indians refused to cooperate with Spanish forces to bring them supplies, to help bring, establish the missions, they rose up and fought and they were demolished by the superior fan Spanish forces. They were easily put down because the Spaniards had better weapons. They were more organized. And their story is a story we are familiar with when we think about our own Native Americans that were pushed aside and that were conquered and were often brutally murdered. The same thing happened. When they rose up and the Spaniards put them down, they killed their leaders. They burned their pueblos. They enslaved men and women both. Oñate ordered the cutting off of one foot of all men over the age of 25. That didn't happen, it was reduced, but it was a brutal sentence. Interesting thing was that this was not legal within the Spanish Empire. The new laws of 1542 protected indigenous people from slavery and from murder. But little retribution was taken against these forces and they were able to push on and continue to pacify indigenous groups, not always so brutally, but in order to establish their missions and bring peace to the northern reaches of the empire. And this is significant for us because these Latino Americans would set up places throughout the Southwest long before the movement of those who came from the former British Empire, long before the movement of those who would call themselves Americans from the United States. So pacification of souls and building of missions, that was the initial reason for setting out to go to the northern reaches of New Spain, but not completely. That's not the only motivation. When you live in imperial society, you also have the motivation of looking for economic gains. And that was true in this case as well. Like Cristobal Colon, 
who had set out to look for riches in the East and ended up encountering a whole new world. He was looking for gold, God, and glory, right? Like Hernán Cortés, who conquered the Aztec Empire in 1521 and spoke of all the great riches and brought back great gold and jewels from the Aztecs. Like Francisco Pizarro, who when he conquered the Incan Empire demanded a room full of gold and silver from their leaders. These men were also looking for gold. And one of the things that caused them to push so far up into the northern reaches was this search for the mythical city of El Dorado, the mythical city of gold. And as they did this, they encountered and pacified indigenous groups along the way. Indigenous groups who always told them about this greater society who had more gold or they should go further and look for more. Of course, they were trying to get rid of these Spanish conquerors, but it allowed them to really get a feel for the land. And Oñate would be the first who would describe things like the grasslands of the Midwest. He would be the first who, with Spanish explorers, would step foot into places like Oklahoma and Kansas. We don't think about that. When we think about the former Spanish empire in what is now the United States, it's typically the places that have names that sound more Spanish. Nuevo Mexico, New Mexico, Texas, Texas, California, California. But they made their way to other places as well. They were also the ones who would create settlements in the form of missions. And these were primarily in places like Texas, New Mexico, and California. So as they established their mission system, they began to bring the indigenous people into congregated settlements. Missions were communities to bring Roman Catholicism to the indigenous people and to bring them in as good subjects of the empire. They also offered some benefits to these people. One of the things that the Spaniards also brought with them when they came to the north was the same as what they had done in places like the Aztec Empire and the Incan Empire and the Caribbean islands. They brought diseases. Diseases to which the indigenous people had no resistance and their numbers were being decimated and they didn't have enough people to work the land. They couldn't come together. So missions protected these people as well. They gave them a community, not only a community for worship, but also a community where they would have food and they could have protection from diseases. And these communities in these missions would be the sites of some of the present day major cities in these regions. San Antonio in Texas was a place of many missions around which a city would be built. San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco in California all had their start as Spanish missions. These were places of Latino Americans. So you can see their history is our history. It's a part of who we are as a nation. Not all the indigenous people were moved into missions without resistance. And in fact, about 80 years after the initial um, setting out to pacify the Indians and bring the North under Spanish control, there was a major resistance movement to the Spaniards being in their lands. But it's difficult. The Spaniards were outnumbered, even with the decimation by disease. There are far more many Indians, as they called them, than Spaniards. But they lived in different villages, in different groups. They had different beliefs. They had different languages. So how do you bring these people together? Well, one group came up with an inventive system. They created strings with knots on them and sent runners 
around to different villages to bring these and each knot represented a day until the resistance was going to take place, the uprising. The Spaniards figured it out two days before the uprising was to take place and so they had it early. And they were initially successful. But as episode one talks about, this uprising in 1680, that came about in an inventive way, could not be successful or could not remain successful. The Spaniards had been there for 80 years. They had better weapons. They had a unified government, a unified government who could stand behind them and send others to support them. Not only that, they had a shared language and a shared culture, which would bring them together as a people. And this is something that would help them to retake the region 12 years later and to put down further uprisings. It's something that would help them to keep control of the region. It's something around which they could come together as a people. And this is significant because this is a part of the history of Latino Americans. It's a part of who they still are today. Not the uprising, not putting down of the uprising, but this sense of shared heritage and of shared language. So by the end of the 18th century, the Spaniards were fully established in the western part of the current United States. They had mission systems that established themselves across the Southwest and up the California coast. And when Mexico gained its independence from Spain in 1821, the territory simply became Mexican. It was no longer a Spanish empire, a part of the Spanish empire. It was a part of the nation of Mexico for a short while. Then what happened is a war with those who wanted change. A war from those who had been a part of the British Empire in the United States. A war that we call the Mexican-American War. But Mexicans call the War of the Northern Invasion. Now, the reasons for the war, the desire of Texas to secede from the nation, of, of Mexico, the desire of the expansion of US territory, is not so as important as what the human element of the war was. The history of Latino Americans and what came after the war. With the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that ended the war in 1848, Mexico lost half of its national territory. Not only that, tens of thousands of Mexicans were now foreigners in a country that had taken them over. So we think today about Mexicans who crossed the border. What happened in this time period was the border crossed Mexico and brought tens of thousands of people into this nation. These Mexicans were protected under this treaty, at least in theory. They were told they could keep their lands, that they could keep, they could sell their properties and keep all profits without having to pay taxes. They could leave with those monies. They could stay Mexican or they could choose to become U.S. citizens. It was up to them. But the Land Act that followed of 1851 basically gave them a year to verify and make claims to their lands and decide upon their citizenship. And they had to do this in English-speaking courts and they had to figure out how to work with the United States law, which was difficult. So oftentimes, they mortgaged their properties to hire translators and to cover court costs. And then they lost their lands when they couldn't pay their mortgages. So many of these people who had started out as Spanish citizens, and then for a short while might have been Mexican citizens, now became landless, second-class citizens in a new country. 
and in a new country where not everyone wanted them there. This is the time period in the United States of the belief in manifest destiny. The idea that it was the destiny of the United States to spread from coast to coast, from water to water, because we were a superior Anglo-Saxon race. And many people who held this belief in manifest destiny had no desire for these indigenous or mixed race people to become a part of their nation. They did not want equality for them. They did not want to keep them there. And particularly in Texas, there began a drive to push these people out, to push these people home, as it was said. And many of them left. They had to go back to Mexico, even though many of them had never lived in the territory that is currently the borders of Mexico. So they had a choice. They could be strangers in the land they had always known or strangers in the land of their heritage. Those who stayed in the United States became a part of our history and a part of our future. Those who left and went back to Mexico are a part of our history, and many of them would also be a part of our future. But the ideas that came about with this war would oftentimes stick up until this current situation, this current time in which we're living. The fact that Mexico was so easily conquered by the United States meant that the inferiors had been conquered by the superiors and they didn't necessarily belong. And as we'll see in further episodes, this idea often carried forward. What is our history? What is our past? What is the claim that we have to be members of this society? We are not here to threaten or to beg. We are here to participate. You cannot close your eyes and your ears to us any longer because we are here. Most people are saying Spanish, the Mexicans, indigenous peoples do not have the special inheritance of liberty that we have. My father thought that the United States would be like paradise jobs for everyone. There were thousands of people trying to get across. The toughest part was when I left my mom, No, knowing if I'm going to see her again. Here's a man who's shed his blood, and yet he can't get something to eat. Reckless? Yes. Dangerous? Extremely. Now, did it pay off? Damn right. The first European language spoken in what would become the United States, Spanish. Immigration means it all gets to be part of your identity. I can't believe it! It's crucial that we know who we are, where we come from, and what it's been like. I am so proud to be your mayor. I, Sonia Sotomayor. There's so much at stake for all Americans in how Latinos in the United States do. Captain Juan Seguin, son of a leading Mexican family in San Antonio, Texas, was a survivor among the defenders at El Alamo in 1836. Travis, Bowie, Crockett are our brothers. Seguin became a hero, mayor of San Antonio, and a senator of the Republic of Texas but his story would be buried along with the ashes of his fallen comrades. His Anglo allies will sell him out. They will not protect him when he needed protection. More than a century would pass before a generation of Latinos searching for their identity would unearth the memory of Juan Seguin and the stories of the earliest Latinos in America. What is our history? What is our past? What is the claim that we have to being members of this society. They discovered the memoirs of an orphan girl that shed new light on the long forgotten world of Spanish California. They revealed the story of Mariano Vallejo, the most powerful man in Mexican California. Vallejo welcomed American settlers only to find himself their prisoner. 
they reclaimed the legend of Las Gorras Blancas of New Mexico. Riding under the cover of darkness, the White Caps tore down fences and burned ranches to protest the taking of their lands. We discovered that, in fact, there had been resistance, and some of it even armed resistance. We're trying to construct a history that has not been written. We had a, a blank slate that had to be recaptured, recovered. Tenía siete años cuando el gobierno nos enviaron a mí y a muchos otros niños al norte, a California. Apolinaria Lorenzana was among 21 orphan children sent by the Spanish colonial government of Mexico to populate the farthest reaches of its American empire. Cuando llegamos a la capital de Monterrey, El gobierno nos repartió como perritos entre los habitantes del lugar. By the time Apolinaria settled in Monterrey, the Spanish had dominated the New World for more than three centuries. Many people have this popular vision of Latinos as people who arrived day before yesterday. But when you think about the first European settlement in what would become the United States, St. Augustine in 1565, that predates Jamestown in 1607. The first European language spoken in what would become the United States, Spanish. One hundred years after Columbus's arrival in the New World, Spanish conquistadors and priests pushed into North America, crossing the Rio Grande to search for gold and spread Catholicism. and beyond.